Today on The Spirit Contemporary Life. I wonder when we're silent, how many miracles are missed. Because faith without works is dead. Have you ever found it difficult to share what you believe with the people around you? Or maybe you're not afraid to share what you believe, but you find that many people don't respond very well to what you're saying. Well, either way, I'm glad you're here. On the show today, I'd like to share with you how you can speak out, but in a spirit contemporary way. Let's take a look. John F. Kennedy made a quote during his presidency that people thought he made. And he was actually good at taking sayings and changing them a little bit so that after the saying, his name would go on it. And he said that for evil men to accomplish their purpose, it is only necessary that good men should do nothing. Actually, who said that was a pastor. It was Reverend, Reverend Charles Ackett in the late 1800s. And when you look at this saying, it's very, very powerful, very, very true. There are evil men on our planet and women. And the only thing that's going to stop them from accomplishing their evil purpose is men and women speaking up with what they believe, what uh, they know to be true in God's Word. We need to speak up. Spirit Contemporary, which is one of the, it's the very uh, way that we share the gospel and the way that we do church, doesn't mean that we're to be silent in case we offend people. Cowardice is something we don't talk about, but all of us need to recognize that we need courage to speak up. All of us have stories. A story that comes to my mind all the time when I think about speaking up is we live in a little town called Weldon. It's on the Trans-Canada Highway in Saskatchewan, and my mom and dad, I think, we were there for over 12 years. So all my grades of school were done in a little town called Birch Hills just next to us. While attending school in Weldon and being the preacher's kid in a small town, I was regularly just beaten up weird things as a little boy in grade school just because I was a preacher's kid. And uh, I remember one time in school, this big bully had backed me into a corner and he would just slap my face one way and then slap my face the other way, hard, red welts on a little boy just sitting there. And he was years older than me. And at the time, there was a, a young man in our church who was years older than me as well, very strong, top sportsman, but wasn't serving God. And I remember very clearly not even being able to have the strength to get away from this guy. He just kept throwing me in the corner, backhand me one way, backhand me the other way. And his name was Owen. Owen walked up to this large gentleman and said, you touch him again and I'll take you apart from stem to stern. And he just stood there until that bully turned around and just walked off. He never touched me again. I've never forgotten Owen. And this is 48 years later, and I've never forgotten Owen. I, yeah, give him a hand, just in case he's listening right now. I wonder when we're silent, how many miracles are missed? Because faith without works is dead. Your faith is meaningless to the people around you until you put actions to it. One of the actions of your faith is to speak up. If great men and women do nothing, 
then evil men and women will accomplish their purposes. In Psalms 94, verse 16, it says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost, almost dwelt in silence. A coward's way to deal with every situation is to be quiet, to not speak up, to not step into a crisis, to not share your faith in case you cause offense. The power to be a witness comes from Holy Spirit. And when you begin to get into God's Word and get baptized in the Spirit, something changes in you. And you literally begin to share your faith, not in a way to get a gold star on your chart in heaven, but out of love. I think the greatest offensive thing on the planet is for someone who has the capability to help another but doesn't because of their own embarrassment or they don't want to get involved. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is one of the most unique verses of Scripture in the New Covenant. It says, But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might there are two words for the word power in the King James Bible. One means authority, and one actually means the actual power, dunamis. And so here it's saying there's an actual power that's going to come into your life when you allow Holy Spirit. And we know that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They received their prayer language and began to speak, the Bible says, in other languages. And it says that this Holy Spirit is going to make them witnesses. Interesting about the word witnesses. The word for witness is the word martis in the Greek, where we get our word martyr from. And literally, it is saying that the power of God is so great in your life that you will not only share Jesus, but you won't shut up even if they kill you. What a difference from the early church till today. And by the way, they did give their lives. Eleven of those disciples gave their lives for Christ. Only one lived it out. One of the greatest defenses of the Bible today and the story of Jesus is the fact that the 12 men who followed him around, if they were in on the lie and he really didn't die, he really didn't rise again, they somehow fooled everybody, got him in the grave before he died, or dressed someone like him to look like Jesus, if any of that subterfuge took place, then why did 12 men die for a lie? They died because they knew it was the truth. In fact, most of them before. If you study the word, you'll find that all the disciples knew they were going to die for Jesus. Every one of them knew it. And they knew John wasn't going to die. And they were fine with that. Today, the worst thing you're going to receive is probably just a little bit of teasing if you share your faith. Yet he shuts us down all the time. I'm amazed at the crazy things people believe today and will tell me on a plane or in a coffee shop. Stupid, like just like off the charts crazy. I'm, I'm thinking the most sane belief left on the planet is Christianity. The rest is just crazy stupidness of men trying to make up other stories so that the Bible isn't true because if the Bible's true, then you'd better adhere to what it says. You'd better give your life to Christ. You better live in a way that honors him and others around you. If it's not true, you can do whatever you want. Witnesses. The power to be a witness comes from Holy Spirit. And when you begin to get into God's Word and get baptized in the Spirit, something changes in you. And you literally begin to share your faith, not in a way to get a gold star on your chart in heaven, but out of love, out of such a love and a concern for souls. I remember watching my dad pray on Saturday nights, Sunday mornings, when he was getting ready to get up and preach. And there were times I could hear him crying when he prayed. And when I'd listen to him pray, he was praying, God, give me souls in this service today. He preached over 40 years. 
And only the last five years did he preach to thousands. In those 40 years, he normally preached to 100 up to about 200. He gave and laid down his life. And person after person gave their lives to Christ. And miracle after miracle took place. There was something about a burden for the lost that you begin to have when you give your life to Jesus. When you get into God's word. If you do not have a desire to reach the lost, you need to wake up. The Bible says, wake up, the mighty men. Wake them up. Why? Because Thousands are in the valley of decision. Eternity is real. Don't listen to these naive preachers who say, hell, it's just an analogy. No such thing. We're all going to heaven. Well, then I've just wasted about 38 years of my life. But that's ridiculous. There's an eternity. You are an eternal soul, and you will spend eternity somewhere. And if you are not born again by the Spirit of God, you don't have the ability to exist in heaven. God couldn't even take you there if he wanted to, because until you are born again and your spirit man comes alive with the presence of God, you would be repelled. Sin can't exist in his presence. There needs to be a washing of the blood of Jesus Christ, a cleansing, a change on the inside of you. Let's not listen to some of this, these emerging churches with all these new doctrines to make everybody feel good about themselves. We must share the good news. In my mind, there's about five reasons why people don't share the good news. Okay, but five reasons that I can tell, and I've been preaching now since I was 17, that's almost 40 years, 38 years I've been preaching. And I've tried to inspire people to share, tried to inspire people to make a difference in their job, their neighborhood, tried to inspire people to speak up. People respect you, they honor you, they, they look at you, and if you'll speak up, they will listen. But the enemy's got you convinced, you nobody, you little, you're, you're, you're never gonna be paid attention to. And it's a lie from the pit. There are in a great realm of people around you who will listen to you. Five reasons, number one's pride. I don't wanna share it. Look bad. Be painted as the religious one. You know, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to. Just pride. Then there's fear. I'm afraid it'll negatively impact me. What if I lose my job? What if they find out I'm a Christian and it hurts my advancement to be the supervisor of my department? Fear. Ignorance. I didn't know it was important. I thought that Jesus was going to reach them, whatever. If Jesus could have reached them without you, he wouldn't have sent us an entire New Testament saying, go preach, go share, go into the world. Then there's rebellion. I don't care what you say, Leon. Ain't going to do it. That's rebellious spirit. Then there's laziness. I just don't want the work and the bother. I just want to be blessed, live my life the way I want to live it. Those are about the five reasons I see over the years. There's a boldness that is needed in our lives. There's a boldness that we've got to have. In Acts 4.13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were learned, unlearned, and ignorant men. <laughs> they, were, they, just were, they were unlearned and ignorant. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Ecclesiastes 8.1, let me show you something that you need to understand. Who's, who is as the wise man? Who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. There is something about people confident in God's word, confident in the presence of God, confident in the spirit of God. I was sitting at a restaurant one time, by myself, just studying quietly. And this bodybuilder, huge guy. He looked like a Viking, blonde hair and beard. And he walks over to me, and he couldn't even put his hands in his pockets. And he stops at my table, and I kind of got this uh-oh feeling. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he says, I'm stronger than you. I'm going, are we nine-year-old men in the sandbox? I said, cool and people are listening he says a little step closer i'm stronger than you i said dude i can see that that's cool and he sits down he says but i can tell you have more power than me i said what do you mean he said, i've been watching you do coffee here so i watch you walk in and he says there's something about you 
There's a power. There's a confidence about you. He says, what is it? I said, I don't know if you're going to like my answer. <laughs> he said, well, try me. I said, it comes from God because I serve him. Jesus is in my heart. There's a power, a confidence that men cannot generate on their own that comes from the very presence of God. And you can have it. I can have it. I said, you can have it. And took him out. We sat down in the car, and I shared Jesus with him. On the spot, big tears started coming down his eyes, gave his life to the Lord, started coming to church. You need to understand something. When you engage God's word, when you begin to be filled with his presence, there is a boldness about your face. You know, I don't know how to explain it, but everybody here will understand what I'm about to say. When you meet people, they carry a weight about them. You can walk into a business and know that this guy is like very bottom. You'll meet somebody else, and just in the weight of his words, the facial expressions, the way he, he or she carries himself, you know you're talking to a high-level leader. You guys can't tell? Yeah, you can, can't you? There's a weight about them that they carry. I don't know how, how else to put it. Did you know that one of the definitions of the anointing of the presence of God is weightiness? When you begin to know God's word, when you begin to be filled with his presence and have Holy Spirit on the inside of you, there is a weightiness about you that people will sense and know. You don't have to put it on. You know, us men, we call it the ice face. It comes out of a term that the Mongols used to use in Mongolia, uh, that it was like the face for war. It was the ice face. It was unemotional. It would be kill you in the drop of a hat. And men are good at putting on the ice face. It's just like, stare you down, walk into a room. I'm important. I'm special. Look at me. You don't have to do that when the presence of God is upon you because you can be kind and loving. You can be sharing. You can know God's word and care about people. But there's something about you that is weighty. And it's not you. It's the presence of God. And then there's a boldness that will not be stopped. I'll tell you a story about being a paramedic. I was in Selkirk for seven years in an ambulance EMA program that then became the first paramedic program in the province and I was a part of the team that were first trained to be paramedics and we'd had three suicides two were on staff and one was someone that we all knew so we were just sitting around as friends and all of us have seen stuff that would if you're in the emergency field here you know what I'm talking about that you don't share with other people but you can talk about amongst yourselves and so they began this conversation of how taking your own life takes courage. Taking your own life is a strength that you need to have. I don't know if I could do that. And they begin to glorify suicide. For 30 minutes, I sat and listened. And I didn't know if I should speak, but I couldn't be silent anymore. The last person that I'd gone to as a suicide was a single dad with two toddlers who used a 22, and they played around until we found out. So I, in that room filled with nurses, paramedics, and doctors, I said, yeah, I see where you guys are coming from, but I'm sorry, I see it as the coward's way out. Now, that wouldn't make it with a lot of our mental health professionals who, would be, who, who will be upset at me and send me letters. But I'm not glorifying suicide to encourage my friends who are going through a rough year or one hell of a month or a, a mental thing that has got them struck. I am not glorifying suicide. I'm going to treat it and take it down and glorify standing another day, winning, getting through, getting help, making sure that your kids see you growing up, making sure your spouse is with you. Years later, someone that was sitting in their conversation told me how glad they were that I had said that because of how what they were going through. And we, in, in, if you're in the emergency field, we often say, would say things seem to come in threes. If you get one accident, you get two more. If you got one suicide, you're going to get two more. We have all these crazy little Murphy's laws in emergency care. And, uh, and, and so just the fact that I would not glorify suicide 
totally saved one man's life that was there. And I don't know how many others. That's all I had to do. Now, guess what? The rest of them didn't agree with me. Well, Leon, what if you offended somebody? You need to get over. You need to decide that I will be tactful, I will be spirit contemporary, but I will not be quiet. You don't have to be a perfect Christian to share Jesus with others. There is no one way to share Jesus that will work in every situation. You just need to choose to step out in faith and share. Allow Holy Spirit to speak through your life. This is a big part of what I call living the Spirit contemporary life. That means that you allow Holy Spirit to flow through you. You begin to have a relationship with Him. He is supposed to be your helper. And he'll also help you to know what to do and say in every situation so that you're contemporary for that situation or for that person, uh, that you're relevant so that people sense and see on you not an old religious judgmental thing, but something fresh and new. Spirit contemporary messages have not only been transforming the lives of Christians, but through relevant and relatable teachings, Spirit contemporary is able to reach people from all walks of life. You can be a part of this life-changing ministry by partnering today. Here's how. You have the opportunity to share spirit contemporary messages like the one that you heard today with people all over the world. So don't wait. Partner with us today. I'd like to share with you this quick conversation I had with my friend Beth Jones about how we as Christians can effectively reach the people around us. Let's take a look. Hey everybody, I'm here with Beth Jones and it's great to have you with me. Thank you. Awesome to be here. We would all be what we call, I call spirit contemporary. We, we want to be spiritually alive, moved, energized by Holy Spirit, yeah. but we want to be contemporary. Tell me a little bit of how important that is to you. Why, do you think that's a really big issue as we look forward? Yeah, no, I really do. I think it's the biggest issue. How are we a church that reaches the outsiders, reaches the lost, reaches the seekers, is the kind of church our people want to invite their friends to, while at the same time being the kind of churches where they're actually growing and they're getting their roots down deep in the Word and in faith and in being led and filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, all the things we've been talking about. So for us, um, I don't know that we have all the answers. I don't think there's a magic bullet. I mean, it's being led by Holy Spirit and how to do church, how to do life. And so we've endeavored to, to preach and to practice worship and the Word and church in such a way that an outsider comes in and tastes and sees, okay, God's good, there's something here, and you all aren't freaking me out. You've got something, and it's something I don't have, and now I'm thirsty and I'm hungry for it. So See, I think that was one of my misbeliefs years ago, which is probably why it's such a passion for me now. Anything spiritual would always embarrass me, yeah. be weird, and put on a show. Mm -hmm. And so I got to a place in my life where I just thought, I'll just go win souls. Yeah. And I don't want to move in the things of the Spirit until God finally corrected me, took me back into the Word and said, where do you see Jesus doing this? Where do you see the disciples? They just moved in power. They touched cities. They changed people. And it set me free to yeah, realize that the cool. Holy Spirit could be in us and the coolest thing. He's the most relevant thing that ever happened. I know. I agree with you 100%. And we don't have to shrink back. And we don't have to get into a ditch. Exactly. But I think it's our human nature is sort of to do that, isn't it? To, it to is. be in one way or the other. But. Yeah. Getting down the center of the road and reaching people. <laughs> thank you for being on with me. Ah, thank you. God Loved bless it. You. Thanks. Our best example on how to reach people is in the life of Jesus himself. So take some time and look into how he reached out and touched people. Father, I pray right now that you give them the courage to step out of their comfort zone to be like Jesus was. Everyone was attracted to him. I pray that they would learn to love people, encourage people, to share Jesus through their story of what he has done for them. I pray this over them in Jesus' name. Amen. All over the world, there are people who have not yet heard about the love of Christ, people who desperately need it. We all have an important part to play in sharing this message. God's given us his beautiful life to enjoy, but while you are living it, be very aware that the message you know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. 
Reaching people with the gospel is the very heartbeat of this ministry. This is why we work so diligently to make our programs relevant and contemporary, translating hundreds of materials into French, Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, Farsi, and many more. Because of the generosity of partners like you, our programs have been able to reach millions, not only here at home, but also in South America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. There is still so much work to do. We will not stand by idly because people's eternity lie in the balance. We need to act now. People need to hear about the love of Jesus and His amazing grace today. Together, we will share Jesus in a spirit contemporary way. And together, we will see miracles.